All right, just give a little bit for people to log on in. Hello, people, as you join us. I feel like there's always that time that you get your calendar reminder of, oh, there's this thing happening, and then <laughs> yeah. rush over to the computer. <laughs> And if the lights go out, I do apologize. <laughs> the, the feed won't cut out because the phone will just go straight to the cell tower, but the lights might go out. Uh, It'll be very we're dramatic. We're in the middle of a storm, so uh, I apologize if that happens. Oh my goodness. All right, and the Facebook Live is now starting up, so let's get the boring info part of the evening out of the way. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us to celebrate Olivia Chada's debut novel, Rise of the Red Hand. Just as a reminder to everyone, Olivia will be answering questions after the presentation. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you can see that there is a Q&A button. So you can submit questions through there. Um, we also have copies of Rise of the Red Hand available for sale on our website. And I am dropping a link to that chat right now. Um, and now, without any further ado, it is my honor to introduce Olivia Chara and her in conversation partner with this evening, uh, Catherine M. Valenti. Olivia Chara has begun her writing career with a stint in Los Angeles, writing comic book scripts for Fathom. She's a PhD in creative writing from Binghamton University and a master's in creative writing from the University of Colorado Boulder. Her research centers on exile, folklore, and fairy tales and the environment. She's a first-generation American of Punjabi Sikh and Latvian German descent and lives in Colorado with her family and two very odd dogs. Catherine M. Valenti is the New York Times best-selling author of over two dozen works of fiction and poetry, including Palmset, The Orphan's Tale series, Deathless, Radiance, and the crowdfunded phenomena, The Girl Who Circumvented Fairyland in a Ship of Her Own Making, and the four books that followed it. She is the winner of many awards, including the Lambda and Hugo Awards, and she has been a finalist for the Nebula and World Fantasy Award. She lives on an island off the coast of Maine with a small but growing menagerie of beasts, some of which are human. Now I'm going to pass the uh, virtual mic over to Olivia to start us off with a brief reading. Thank you again for being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, everybody. And thanks for that intro. Um, so I'm just going to read a quick uh, paragraph or two from Rise of the Red Hand. <clears throat> there it is. Um, and just to give you kind of a setup for this book, um, this is an excerpt from the second chapter and Ashiva is a smuggler for the Red Hand. And in this scene, she's waiting to meet a doctor um, who's been smuggling her um, infants the Uplanders have been discarding uh, for their genetic imperfections. And she takes these infants to her home in the Narrows Orphanage where they can um, either join the Red Hand, which is kind of a revolutionary group, um, or they can just live freely. And as she waits for this doctor at the bottom of the central strata, she takes in her surroundings. My shoulder and thoracic back ache every day. <clears throat> the thanks I give to the mechanic for making my broken body whole is so loud sometimes that my pain becomes only a ghost, only a mind whisper. The nerve roots where the replacement begins in my shoulder joint are redirected, but their phantom memories remain the agony takes its turn on days when it's quiet, when I'm still. Silence and stagnancy are just for decay. They invite death. It's only when I'm still that I look at the arm she gave me, the metal bones and joints, the cables and ports, wires and circuits, and I feel its weight pull on my body, equal to unequal to the rest of me. It's heavy. It's me, but not me. But when I'm running, there's no time to think or feel. In motion, doubt becomes a whisper again. Then I'm unbroken, with purpose. I hate waiting. The people who make me wait, I hate even more. Across the alley is a small Bill Wallace stand, Mr. Belucci's, the last human stand. All others have been sold and converted to bot machines. 
I can smell the warm spices in my dry mouth salivates. Well, might as well eat if my meat's gonna be late again. Gotta keep moving. I press my hands together and nod at the old man. How's business, uncle? You still have a snack for your favorite customer? He's short, as though time and work has forced gravity to pull harder in his body. Acha Shiva. If it weren't for the Alliance Con, spectators pouring into town. I take in the area for UAVs and instead see a new hollow screen projecting above his stand on the building wall behind him. The pack's emblem of fists hammering down and crushing, crushing the broken body of a massive war mecca. This is how they see themselves. The heroes who ended World War III. The ones who united everyone and stopped a complete nuclear holocaust. While the planet survived for the most part, it was changed. Millions burned to ash that day. Their ghosts rightfully haunt us. They almost ended it all. But isn't Alliance Khan good for business? His glare is sharp like the tip of a knife. They've lost the taste for our food, the kind made by hand. He shakes his head. I take in the posters on the surrounding walls celebrating the 25th Alliance Day and what the pack calls the reunification of the world after a nuclear catastrophe. We all celebrate the end of the war because we're still alive but we also remember why we were fighting over resources and how the sky turned orange from pollution and the seas swallowed hundreds of miles of coastal cities. End of a war, beginning of a new era, but being alive is not always living. That was great. Uh, I, I, you know, I found the first chapter so uh, compelling. It's interesting that you choose to like jump over that really exciting, almost cinematic uh, opening of, of of the book. I want to know where the idea for this book came from. What is the genesis of this book? When did it start? Yeah. What started it for you? I think um, it was a few years ago. I think I started drafting in 2018, and I really wanted to write a book that was <clears throat> had just two characters. It was mostly about the characters at first, but that. Um, they were from two different places and opposite sides and that somehow they would be smushed together and then be forced to kind of deal with each other and deal with their hate for each other until they kind of grew to understand each other, maybe not empathize all the way, maybe kind of just understand a little bit better. I started writing it in a fantasy landscape at first, like a really high fantasy. Oh, interesting. It was, it was super fun and super happy and I felt like, oh... I wanted to go a little bit, it just didn't, I did never got past 30,000 words, you know, that 30,000 mark where you're like, nah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, well, it didn't work. I worked really hard on that and then no. So I did it again and I, I felt that the clip of the pacing was much better in this future world. And I had, I don't know, a different kind of purpose and it, the near, near future kind of India, South Asia landscape um, just, kind of resonated with me on a personal level. So I think that once I found that place, then I found the characters and the voices right. to kind of go with them. But it was a couple of years ago that I wrote this, so. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we'll talk about the sort of eerie prescience of it uh, <laughs> a little bit. I, what, I, I promised Twitter that we would be talking about a uh, cyberpunk dystopia meccas and extensive research, <laughs> so. Let's talk about the research you did. There's oh so much detail in this book. Uh, there's just like even down to I, I feel like the science, obviously there's a lot of science, but like one of the sciences in this science fiction is actually urban planning in a yeah. weird way. Uh, and like things that a lot of authors would just skip over. You were not afraid to, you know, dive into and really give us a uh, an idea of how this stuff works. So talk to me about that. I mean, it's it's such like a gluttonous experience you know the research <laughs> process it's just like I know and then you just go off on this place um I don't know if I did a lot of research before I started yeah I kind of like juggled research as I was drafting the first really crappy draft um and the the first thing I did was just like pour over really terrifying maps of the future like you know from extreme views of what what would the land look like um underwater and what would the, what would we be dying of and what what are going to be the impacts on the body and what animals would survive and would the insects you know i just went down this crazy <laughs> <clears throat> and you know it's so i didn't get depressed by it i felt like empowered by this knowledge because it's something that kind of keeps me up at night sometimes thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow and uh 
yeah, it just kind of, so we got into, I got into this like cartographic kind of mapping process, too many maps I looked at, then I started moving away from that. <laughs> I got into like the cities are really kind of these like living creatures, you know, with, um, and if you go to a place like Mumbai or you go to a place like New Delhi and New York, London, you, you feel this like, it's like it, this entity that's alive, you know, and I really wanted to capture that, all those pieces of it. And they are like these palimpsest beings, you know, with half of them underneath the ground that you don't even see or understand. And then the part that you do see who's allowed to go up there and how are you um, allowed. And I kind of use the city central as like this um, physical manifestation of the caste and class system, you know, and um, to have like all these tiers that you're allowed to go into. And then thinking about these in-between places, like um, I studied a lot of folklore and I'm obsessed like most people who write fantasy and, and folkloric stuff with like the liminal spaces, like the mm -hmm. in-between things and how that kind of terrifies us and what's uncanny about that. And so I really wanted to smush that together with this idea that like, <clears throat> There's two solutions to the future, this natural solution, and then this technological solution. And they're kind of at war with each other, even in our bodies, um, you know, that the integration of the scrap metal into our bodies to rebuild them. And then the, the people with a lot of money have these abilities to have beautiful, really expensive technology. And then also the mech as like, um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of anime Ghost in the Shell, the original anime is like <laughs> my favorite movie of all time and Blade Runner and I just always enjoyed that question of um, what is, what are we in, and when we look at an AI or when we look at a robot that discomfort we feel from like looking at them is not like is that human we think about are we human and how mm -hmm. creepy that feels. Um, so the mechs felt natural to me as like this hyper um, militaristic extension of the human just dominating the space, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah, it was it was a pretty crazy. The craziest thing I found was the weirdest thing that happened was every time I was like, I got this great crazy idea for a, a neural sink. And then I'm like researching it and it's like Elon Musk launched something <laughs> similar last year and he's, he's already implanted these neural threads in a pig's brain yeah. and then don't worry it's, it's Elon Musk it's probably not it is Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> and then the weirdest the weirdest part was I was looking at like building these neo soldiers and how technology can kind of um, advance the human body and on the like uh, on the battlefield and it's like, wouldn't it be crazy if we found a way to implant these mechanisms in our body to stabilize our, you know, chemistry? I mean, lots of people have done this before. It's not like I'm the first person to think of that. This is this is something that sci-fi does. And then DARPA has this this tech RX tool that they're implanting inside of soldiers to help them actually overcome PTSD and modulate their pain and modulate their pancreas and all these things so the weirdest thing is that like I think I'm looking up things that aren't here yet but they're here already and the future is so already here it doesn't have jets and you know cars flying around it's just like really actually happening well that's one of the dangers of writing near future science fiction you know you, you run into the present and the past <laughs> yeah. quite, quite a bit uh, when I, I wrote space opera and space opera is not serious science fiction in any way it is a long joke but like it's set in the it's near so, future so brilliant oh thank you but <laughs> it's set in the near future and like nme magazine is in it which folded the year the book came out like even something as small as that like son of a you, just, you couldn't <laughs> couldn't hold out couldn't go online no fine uh <laughs> Yeah, no, you know, it's funny, I, I, I say this, I don't, I do not mean this to be condescending at all, it is a compliment, because this is one of my favorite sort of pieces of media, but it reminded me of Final Fantasy VII mm. in some 
phase, um, which has the sort of Midgar people living up above and people living down below and the trains and uh, the sort of whole plot around materia, which is this thing that gives everyone superpowers, but it also poisons you slowly and kills you. Uh, and I love Final Fantasy VII and think it's one of the most brilliant uh, world building exercises ever so the fact that i immediately went oh my god this reminds me so much of final fantasy 7 uh but like with you know realistic <laughs> world building going on instead of just oh whatever magic <laughs> <It's true. laughs> I, I mean i i was a gamer a long time ago and i that that's a big compliment thank you so much and yeah i don't <laughs> I'm i think, take it as a compliment there are some people who would be like i'm not a no I, I, think, but like, I mean game building is like I, I just can't even, it's like, it's more than uh, a book. It's just, yeah, teams of brilliant people coming together to make that work. <laughs> I haven't played games in a long time, but wow. Yeah, that's cool. I, I, sh I love, I love well, that. Well, there, there's a big remaster reboot of Final Fantasy VII that are releasing in parts. So you can go uh, play it. And boy, that first scene on the train is just, it just reminds me so much of the first sort of exposition scene on the, the train in that. And again, huge compliment because it's a oh, very man. exciting scene though people are talking a lot. Oh, um, cool. Yeah. So, uh, so what, I mean, what inspired you to write a Southeast Asian cyberpunk? I, I, mean, I want to give you a chance to talk about your heritage a little bit here and, mm -hmm. and just the sort of kind of the state of science fiction and how you feel about the kind of lack of cultural milieu uh, going on in certain subgenres. Yeah, I think that's, you know, uh, my dad, uh, I'm first generation. My dad was born in what's now Pakistan, and he came down in one of those um, trains, um, uh, those like death trains into India um, when he was one year old and his mom was 16. And, uh, you know, not a lot of our relatives survived that. And it was, you know, on war on all sides. It was like this bloody thing that happened. And I don't think anybody's ever kind of calculated they say around 2 million people died. No one's going to agree on that. There's still so much tension and animosity. And also this idea of borders really kind of kind of came into my our, our lives as kids. We started thinking about that a lot. We heard a lot of stories <laughs> as children, like terrible things you shouldn't tell children, um, but make good stories later. So yeah, so that, that definitely inspired me. And then thinking about one of the, most interesting things that I've noticed when I visit India is that the people on in every place I've been to are so creative. Um, <laughs> there's this word, word um, and it happens everywhere all over the world, but I've noticed it a lot in India because that's where I've traveled. But they say jagad, which means like hack or like a people's hack, like a a poor man's hack for a problem that the government should have fixed. So like, <laughs> you can't get a telephone line in your house for like five years. So you just like run your own cord to the telephone pole and the, the poles are covered in these nests of cables and you know, the government failed. So let me just fix it myself. And things like that, like That's you do your word. own well. And yeah, it's just like, so it's, it's, it's like double edged in that it's like, um, it's great because they're resilient and smart and you figure out a way, but they shouldn't have to have figured out that way, right? Yeah. And I think a lot of countries have that. You just have to find a way. So you do certain things to survive. So I really noticed that like cleverness um, early on. And my, I, I think it's just a part of um, South Asia in general. Like, how do you survive? Well, you do it, you just keep going and you find a way. Um, and so I thought in the future, of course they're gonna survive. You know, we think about the future a lot and, and the conversation of the future always tends to revolve with like a western lens you know I, i'm american and i live in america and i'm western you know um but a lot of these places around the world are already feeling the impacts of climate change like devastating ways and we're yeah. thinking about the farmer protests right now it's their soil is destroyed you know and yeah. so i think i just wanted to kind of say in some way that you know, these places are going to be here in the future. Um, and I wanted to write a story that like, I would have been excited to read as like a 16 year old. Um, oh yeah, like brown kids doing crazy things in the future, <laughs> like saving the world. Um, so on a very simple level, that's what I wanted to see, but also on a more 
dangerous level. I feel like India is very interesting in how they, in every country is. Every country has a way of managing people um, and their population, but they also have this identification system. So as I was like researching, you know, these real things, like what you said so well, when you research the future, you come across the present, <laughs> like, yeah. So there's this, this uh, new kind of identification system in India that's um, biometric where they scan your irises and your in your fingerprints and it's going it's very messy and people are not happy they're happy about it they're terrified about it they're not getting their rations and it's just this crazy controversial thing right now so I felt like oh perfect <laughs> this is the perfect place to ask these hard questions how are you survive if the population is over burdened and um, the cities, uh, the coastal cities are gone, you know, what would you do? How would you choose who gets to live? Um, and I felt like, well, maybe they wouldn't, they would let an algorithm decide because they don't want the responsibility of having to choose that. But the algorithm mm -hmm. of course is created by humans. Yeah. So it's an innately flawed, you know. I think it's, it's so interesting how much science fiction has changed in the last 20 years, whereas like, books and movies that came out 20 years ago talking about iris identification and facial identification. Like that was a ha ha ha, isn't that so scary, crazy talk, right? And now it's just literally happening in multiple countries at once to extents that like many science fiction writers totally failed to uh, really understand or predict. So it was like this wacky, uh, you know, metaphor 20 years ago that is reality now. Uh, and like being a science fiction writer right now, as governments seem to want to race us to the worst thing, um, is is a, a quite the prospect. Yeah, it's insane. It's it's. It, I kept I kept feeling like um, I'm writing the present in so much of this, and it's uh, it, it's frustrating because um, I feel like you know in some ways. Writer, I mean, writing is an act of hope, right? In so many ways, like you're writing because you hope something, whatever it is. And, you know, I want people <laughs> to see these certain things as really wild and out there, but here they are um, being normal everyday things that we're kind of just accepting or maybe we're rioting against in some kind of ways. But yeah, it's really, it's really strange the landscape of sci-fi right now. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, <laughs> and it's diversifying too, which is really exciting. I feel like so many, um, so many books that are coming out right now are really kind of pushing this uh, level of diversity of every every aspect of diversity, writing mm -hmm. different types of stories in the yeah. future. You know, I'm I'm excited to be a reader today. <laughs> well, that leads so perfectly into my next question, which is that. It, in science fiction and fantasy, we often talk about books being in conversation or in the great conversation, if we're feeling very fancy that day, uh, with other books and not just books, but movies and television and, and games and all of the sort of grand tent of, uh, of, of speculative fiction. So what would you say, Rise of the Red Hand, who, who, who are you having a conversation with? Is it in conversation with other books and, and, and who, who else is uh, at the tea table? <laughs> I love that question because it makes these, it's like these characters can come out of their suffering plot and kind of <laughs> have a nice tea together. <laughs> the world's not going to end for five seconds. They get to be a normal teen and here hang out with, you know, I feel like War Girls, Tochi's book, um, War Girls. And uh, that, that, that feels like kind of when I came out with this book or we got our book deal, that book just came out and I'm like, yes, <laughs> that's so interesting because it's political again. And um, these, these women are having to fight their way out of something so, um, so difficult. And then I think uh, Cindy Pond's Want for sure is a book that kind of inspired me as I was drafting it. I found it as I was ending the book and I was like, oh, I can do this. Oh, because you always, I mean, I feel like I really wanted to see um, something come before me or something give me, I, not like I needed permission, but it is nice when you're like, I can have a comp. <laughs> like <laughs> there's, something, there's something that can be like this, you know? And then um, uh, Shipbreaker maybe, you know, that kind of gritty future post-apocalyptic. Um, it, it very it has like a really deep sense of place. And I think that all those 
books too have like this really interesting sense of place and also history sitting behind them. Hopefully all the characters can get, get together and uh, <laughs> clean up and have a party. <laughs> have a of, clean up party. <laughs> yeah, instead of just surviving all day with their cybernetic bodies and scrapping lives, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, one of the biggest thematic threads that go through Red Hand is, is class issues. Uh, it sort of fuels it from top to bottom, so to speak. Uh, so what what drives you to center that in the narrative the way you do? Is I actually feel like for all people in, you know, real world political discourse talk about class issues all the time. Actually, uh, it's it's not even close to the majority of science fiction books that that do. Uh, a lot of writers tend to center uh, either, you know, the very poor and then everyone rich is garbage, or, uh, you know, the very rich and everyone poor is a faceless mass. Uh, so what drove you to do better? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I think um, I, I just try to, I, I don't know, I think, um, one of the things that, well, the book is so um, focused on, and my motivation was so focused sometimes on kind of the climate question about the future. And I think um, I just kept thinking about how the climate is going to impact certain people and how, and what are the solutions for these certain people. And, um, and I wanted to kind of pan out further from South Asia so many times because so many different parts of this world are doing really different things to survive. Um, I just didn't have a lot of space in the first book, but I really wanted to show how in this world, um, there are a lot of differences and a lot of, and, and then there was a class problem when we talk about climate, you know, like the lowlands and the places that get flooded are obviously going to be devastated and the places like we see in Texas, they're not ready for storms in winter and they're already going to be impacted by just tiny, tiny uh, decrease in temperature just destroys your plumbing like simple things like that. Um, I don't know my my grandfather was a civil engineer my dad's an engineer I think I just kind of grew up thinking about like the functionality of things and I. Um, and I really wanted to think about like how does everyone get impacted by this subtle change and what food are they eating and why would they eat that and uh, what do the sewers look like I think. Um, I really thought that you know the, the different versions of the class was important because. Um, also the upper uh, uplanders need the downlanders still in their lives to survive so even though they think they're better they still need them in their houses they still need them to work for them they still need them. And so I thought that was kind of cruel and terrible to point out, but also really kind of necessary, you know, the class divide. Yeah. yeah. It's so interesting that you say your your dad and your grandfather civil engineers, because I can completely see that. I feel like this has to be a new question. Like, what does your mom and dad do? What do your grandparents do? Because I think it's really illuminating. Jeff Vandermeer uh, at one point dropped in conversation that his dad's an entomologist in Fiji. I was like, uh-huh. Yeah, okay. he, he he's like, what do you mean? I was like, everything you write about is either mold or bugs, man. <laughs> like, I don't, know, I don't know what to tell you, but it's like a whole thing with you. <laughs> it's, that makes so much sense about him. I'm like, I'm like thinking about his work. Oh my gosh, everything. Yeah, <laughs> totally yeah. makes sense. <laughs> and I, I mean, I studied literature, but I, I actually started off as a chemical engineer. So I mm. have like, but I'm terrible at math. I have dyscalculia. So like numbers and math is really, it's just really hard for my brain to comprehend it. Um, yeah. But the the theoretical stuff I enjoy so much. So of course I'm like, oh, I get to do this. I'm gonna drink all these books. I read all these scientific reports about this and that. How can I fit this in? Uh, yeah, it was very, it's sometimes <laughs> self-indulgent. <laughs> but you know what, in, uh, indulging yourself is part of the joy of writing a book. It's part of what pays for all the annoying parts of being a, a freelance author. <laughs> uh, so I also want to talk about like our protagonist, without like putting too fine a point on it, is a terrorist. And there's no, no apologies made for that or, or, or 
deflections, particularly from the first page, it's very clear, even though we're, we're very sympathetic to uh, her whole situation. And, you know, we see it from her point of view. Uh, did you worry that you would get pushback on that, either from publishers or from, you know, American readers? You know, it's so funny. I didn't, I love this question and I didn't even think about it. And that's, that's really interesting because when we think about <clears throat> terrorism, domestic or otherwise, we think about brown people and terrorists, you know, there's like, it really is um, an important and, you know, kind of conversation for, for a good decade in America. And uh, I didn't even think about it. Um, <laughs> But, well, but part of what I've written down is like, is this less relevant in a post sort of Rogue One uh, yeah. universe where we've started sort of shedding a little bit of that in science fiction? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I think um, I think I was hopeful that um, people would see her as with because the group, the Red Hand, never harms civilians. They and if they they do something explosive. Um, they definitely could be hurting people unintentionally, but they don't like suit up with bombs. They don't blow up people. They try really to minimize their attacks. <laughs> it sounds like I'm trying to make it. They do the best <laughs> out of the worst. Um, nice terrorists. <laughs> yeah, they're nice terrorists. But um, yeah, but they're like, I think it's because they've just been pushed to this place of if we don't fix something, we are all going to die. And we have to fight because no one else is fighting for us. Um, but you're right, that's a really important question to think about like what, and also this word terrorist, you know, is it uh, whoever reads it in that context is gonna be, you know, the word is defined by that government or that place that they come from. Like we all yeah. see a different terrorist in our mind when we say that word. So I think that's a really good question. I never thought about it, but here she is with a bomb on the cover. Yeah. Ready to blow, ready to blow some stuff up. <laughs> Thinking well, about. Think, you know, the, the, I want to ask when, when exactly you started writing this because so much of it seems quite prescient. And part of that is the Hong Kong protests. And, uh, you know, uh, the, I think the way that, the way that the West is seeing resistance against governments is changing a lot. Um, I think this would be very differently received in 2005 than it is now, for example, you know, uh, and our sympathies are uh, very much with protesters these days, at least the people who, you know, enjoy reading um, <laughs> rather than uh, ra rather than with sort of the status quo. And there is a whole tradition of science fiction where the status quo is the hero in some sense. Uh, and this is very much not that. Uh, so I found I found it very interesting, and and I mean I don't want to be like so brave, but like I you know it's it's definitely a risk, and I admired you for 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 taking that. I think I was just stupid and naive, but, <laughs> but thank you so much. <laughs> I, I feel like there's such a there's I don't know if you remember, but like your first book, sometimes you're just like. I wrote this and they liked it and here we go. And, and then you're looking back going, wow, I, I did it with this book, you know? And this is so <laughs> interesting that this is, this is the thing. I feel like uh, I, I, I think I have a lot of fight in me and there's a lot of injustice in the world. And um, I feel like sometimes our books need to scream a little bit louder than we've been allowed to in so many ways. And, um, you know, I think that that th this book became my like chance to say certain things about the world and people that I haven't had a chance to talk about before. Like even their bodies. Um, I've had so much surgery. I've been in so many accidents. I have so many scars uh, from snowboarding accident that basically destroyed my body and they had to rebuild it. Um, and I always had dreams and nightmares and about my body being metal or waking up with like a prosthetic arm or these, you know, fibers in my spine. So in certain way, like I really wanted to kind of look at PTSD in a book too, because I feel like so many times uh, a soldier or a story in sci-fi, we can, or any book, we could just run through this traumatic event and then be fine. 
you know, because they just keep going. But like, I really wanted these characters to kind of suffer and feel through their trauma in, in, in the book and kind of have the past and the present sitting with them at the same time as they kind of manifest this new future, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's so interesting. I always find it really interesting to talk to speculative writers because so many of us are secretly writing confessional books. It's just that like, there is uh there are layers and layers of concealment going on as we like work out our own trauma and what's happened to us mentally physically everything else uh within books as much as any literary or realist writer does we just put like a big mecca on it uh <laughs> <laughs> make it make my trauma a mech and make it crush that rock yeah yeah exactly, <laughs> oh, like, exactly. <laughs> so when did when did you when did you start this because like it's not just the fact that there is a pandemic in it, it's that it talks about the whole history of pandemics uh, that sort of gets churned up with, with climate change and like the fourth Ebola outbreak and all of this stuff, which is pretty much what we're looking down the barrel of now, uh, as much as we're all focused on COVID-19, like it's not going to be the last one. Uh, and nobody seems to want to have that conversation because it's it's too much because we all have PTSD uh, right now. But yeah. like it, it's definitely you ended up being able to fold the very near future into this. Yeah, it was pretty weird. I have a I have a good friend um, who's a professor of biology um, and Rob Bushwald and he poor guy, I just bothered him so much every day <laughs> about disease and virus and pandemics. And he's a biologist. So he really kind of opened my eyes to the idea of this, um, the zoonotic viruses and how almost all viruses are zoonotic. And, um, and this was before, so it was 2018. I really started working on this and editing it in 2019. And so when we came upon 2020, um, I was totally traumatized by that because I had just written, you know, I think uh, I think in the book it was like the permafrost had melted and, um, you know, these viruses were kind of appearing and things like that. I'm not exactly sure the transmission, how it actually uh, ends up coming down, but it was it was through birds and through all these things. And yeah, it was kind of just, I kind of, I, I, I actually fell into, and I think a lot of us did in 2020, once that started happening, I just fell into like this deep depression for several months. Like, what is this? This can't be because I had too much information in my head about what that could be like and how hard that was going to be. Um, as soon as we heard about it, um, you know, I didn't load up on toilet paper, but, <laughs> but, but I didn't but you thought about it. I thought about it. I got I got an extra freezer and I put food in it and I just became really paranoid. And I think all of us did in that level, but it definitely made me sick to know that that was that was coming. And I think like a lot of people, a lot, a lot of virus books have been out lately, you know, like um, the book of M and then Mike Chen's book. And, and it's funny because I think a lot of what happens in the world, it's already inside of us and we're already thinking and worrying about it. And then it just kind of pops out in the book at a certain time yeah. and maybe all at once. And then we're like, it's prescient. And we're like, no, it's just actually we've known. It's like the zeitgeist has been there. <laughs> we're really scared of this. You know, usually it's a zombie, but no, the virus is actually a virus this time. You yeah. know, yeah. Well, Not part just... of our, our job as science fiction writers is just to imagine how bad it can get. So, oh. Okay, oh, lights came back on. So I, dramatic. I, I said, I'm, I'm very much hoping that the power stays on. Uh, it's just a flicker. Um, oh my goodness. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because I, I wrote a I wrote a Mass Effect tie-in novel uh, for a video game oh, called yeah. Mass Effect, but it and it came out in late 2018, and it actually is kind of a locked room mystery on a spaceship, but the mystery is a plague. Uh, so I so wish I knew less about viruses now. I wish I had not spent so much time designing uh, a virus out of many that already exist and learning like all the terminology that everybody else learned in 2020. I learned in 2018 to write oh. that book and like super wish I hadn't done that for my yeah. own. <laughs> for my Ignorance own is really, when, yeah, like it's so much nicer before. 
before it's yeah. all that knowledge. Like, how does a virus transmit itself? How does it grow? How does it replicate? Yep. You're like, what no. is fo- what's a fomite? Like, the, the, yeah. the whole people are gross and terrible. <laughs> like, you're, we are all you're so gross. <laughs> have you read Have you read Contagion? Also, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I when I was a kid, um, it was. I have no explanation for it really uh except maybe that i was i was raised christian scientist which is not a thing to talk about now but they don't believe in disease so i was obsessed with reading medical thrillers as a kid mm-hmm. i loved like robin cook and all of those just like crazy uh world gets destroyed by a plague book so like i've read them all <laughs> again wish i knew a lot less just a lot less <laughs> Um, I think we're going to sort of transition into some audience questions here. Okay. Uh, although I'm going to hold my final two questions for the end. Uh, so let's let's uh, take a question from our uh, the, the people we can imagine are in front of us in the well-lit bookstore where the power is definitely not going out. Hopefully not. <laughs> um, yeah, no, this has been uh, an amazing conversation. Thank you. I love being just like a fly on the wall in these things. Um, so we have two questions that are specifically looking at some inspiration for the book. Um, one of which um, Samantha Colbert was specifically wondering if Olivia was familiar with the Pure Trilogy by Juliana Baggett, um, saying that she see, they see some similarities and wondered if there was any inspiration um, specifically, which have people fused with objects in two classes, the rich ones in the biodome and the poor, poor ones barely surviving. Um, and if you haven't, perhaps that would be an interesting thing for you to check out. Um, I'll definitely read that. I have not read that. Yeah. I wrote it down though. Um, and then Jonathan Smith over on Facebook was wondering about some of the books that had inspired the novel, um, some other dystopian books that you might recommend. I know you had listed some earlier, so I was actually curious to expand that question and to see what other media might have inspired it especially as you were saying um the type of book you were you're writing it almost was exciting to be like oh this is a comp to my book and and finding that connection so i wonder in other forms of media if there was some major influences i i mean i'm a big film buff i i love watching movies so sci-fi movies you know are are my thing in anime i mean i just can't get enough of mech anime and um all of them. I can't say one, <laughs> but the original Ghost in the Shell is definitely there, and the books, and um, you know, the original Blade Runner, um, and then you know, I, I enjoy shows like, um, oh my goodness, I'm just gonna totally blank on it, um, like Altered Carbon and stuff. I can find some really weird things in there, some very problematic things, but also some weird things that are happening in there. Um, I'm just like, all oh, and also. Um, What's one of my favorite shows? Oh my gosh, it's Canadian. She plays eight characters. Oh my gosh. What is uh, Orphan Black? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what a brilliant show. I feel like all those shows are asking these interesting questions about self and identity and all these things, but in really extraordinary ways. But yeah, as for inspiration for this book, I think a lot of it just came from looking at the future and then those, those cyberpunky kind of <laughs> backgrounds. I love anyone who has a passion for mech animes. Uh, some friends and I have been playing a, a tabletop game that is pretty much a mech anime game, and it's been a lot of fun. Um, uh, we also have a, another question from Sarah Gon, um, saying, we've been talking about how prescient rise of the red hand is regarding climate change, pandemics, surveillance states, etc. What do you think we humanity needs to do in order to avert the to avert the kind of future you've depicted in this book? And do you think we'll get there? Which is always the stressful part of being an author, where you're like, I just wrote a book and now I have to have thoughts about the real world. <laughs> well, I feel I feel like that is such a good question. Um, yeah. I I I what, okay, so I, I obviously have thought about this a lot, and I feel like the biggest thing and the most important thing we could possibly do is manage our own information because that alone, our bodies, our minds, everything, everything is being owned by so many big companies right now. And a a normal civilian like me, I I don't even know the layers of where that begins and ends. And so I think we should fight for that battle against um, 
um, data and our data being sold. And because a lot of people, we just don't know. So we keep opting in, you know, the Apple keeps asking us to read this huge contract. And we're like, I don't know what it says. I don't know what it says. And it took like lawyers 36 hours or something like that to read it out loud because it's so long. So I think that's one thing we have to really be aware of. And that's something worth, um, you know, taking, taking uh, an interest in is our information on our personal bodies and uh, even what we're purchased, that should be private. And I feel like if we could stop that, it, um, then we have the ability to actually control uh, our larger lives outside of our physical selves, but our, our virtual selves. Yeah, that's really true. Um, we also have another question from Samantha again, asking, uh, Olivia, could you talk a bit about your path to publishing? Did you have an agent? How did you pitch the book? Since agents want to know specific genres, wondering how this one was classified in order to, to grab an, agent, an agent's attention. Well, I'm lucky that um, Eric Smith's my agent and he likes weird things that are kind of in between things. Um, I, and so, um, I, I had my eye on him for a while because he, he everyone knows him. He's so friendly, A, um, but also because he always liked kind of things that fit between other spaces. Um, and so when I got this, I think he had a tweet that said something like brown, brown kids in the future. I want to see that. And it was like, I was like, okay, I wrote, it, I wrote his name <laughs> down. And then I pitched during DV Pit, actually that Twitter event. And then he liked my tweet and then uh, I sent him the manuscript and then we had a call two days later and that was that. So that was pretty fast on that side, but you know, I've been writing since, you know, forever, like everyone. <laughs> and um, yeah, it, it just, it kind of happened quickly, but I think, um, you know, the, the devil beast that Twitter can be, it also kind of helped me find him and um, actually let me figure out what agents want certain things, you know, the manuscript wish list and that type of thing. So, um, yeah. And then we just looked at it and then we went on sub pretty quickly. So. I think that is so relevant. Just that aspect of something like social media can be an amazing tool and also a dangerous monster. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I also have a, a question as well, kind of going off of that um, in particular, something that I, Feel like I've been finding a lot more especially in YA especially in speculative fiction YA is that there is so much more this space for angry girls and I love it because I feel like when I was a teen reader I didn't have permission to be angry and it was a it was an emotion that I was afraid of um and then especially uh in everyone like there's Rise of the Red Hand there's there's Skate Gracers and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that type of character, what drew you to that type of character? I mean, it, it um, I guess it's me. <laughs> my, my angry girl. Um, I'm like, I'm very much a tomboy. I'm very much, you know, I'm an Aries and I like run into things with my head all day and I get hurt a lot. And um, I, I feel like um, there's, I like, I think that the, the strong female who can think clearly and plan things and, you know, work problems out and things like that, you know, a lot of, some of the criticism has been about like, well, the love, you know, the love, they, some people have needed more romance or more love and this and that, but I feel like she's such a forward thinking character that she's needs to physically be propelled in a direction. Otherwise she gets very uncomfortable, but of mm -hmm. course the her um her other character Riz Ali he's like cinnamon roll uh, boy who's really good looking and stuff like that just kind of soften the landscape of her world so that she could see um that she doesn't need to be hard all the time that she can learn how and that's her kind of part of her character arc is learning how to feel learning how to let herself feel, you know, in this world that's kind of hardened her so much, literally physically made her metal, you know? <laughs> Thank you, that, that is a wonderful. Um, unless we have any other audience questions popping in, Kat, I was gonna pass back to you because I know you yeah. said you have another couple of questions. Yeah, so um, I got a little confused. I'm like, is this your first novel? I have a adult novel that came out, but it's adult literary. So yeah, that's kind of what I, I 
why I was a little confused. Um, so what if, if you could, you know, fully control everything and determine what people are going to take away from this book? Like, what do you want people to take away if it's just condensed down into one shot of espresso? I love that question. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it <clears throat> on the very like um, core, I just hope the right readers get it because I feel like, you no, know, I think we all feel that about our books. It's like, with the, in the hands of the right reader, they're going to feel something really interesting. And, and the wrong reader, it's not going to be for them. And that's okay. But I feel like um, if it falls in the hands of the right reader, who kind of relates to these characters in some kind of level and uh, can feel not terrified by the future, but hopeful that they can actually change the world that we live in, and that they can demand a better world from their government and things like that. I feel like, I hope it's empowering in some kind of level. Um, and since it's, it's a duology, so this is like part one and then part two, and they're going to be met, meant, meant to be read as a pair. Hopefully, I mean, I think somebody could read the second book and feel like they read a book, but I feel like they work really well together. So I feel that it's, it's hopeful and all. I feel like that's the direction it's going. And um, to feel like you can do something. I feel so much we talk and teens are always talked down to by the world. Like, don't do this, don't do that. Wait, it's not time to do anything. Everyone tells you to wait. Um, that bothered me so much about being a teen. It's like, I want to do it now. No, wait, um, you're not ready. You're not old enough. And I feel like so many people are proving that wrong. Like Greta, you know, who's changing the world. Uh, so I feel like I hope that they can, um, if in the right reader, they can just be hopeful about the future and that they feel empowered to do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. You've called it hope punk, uh, yeah. which I think was coined by Alexandra Roland. Am I right on that? I think so. uh, yeah. But yeah. So like, I mean, I think even the word hope punk is kind of powerful these days. Uh, the world has changed a lot and, uh, I, I, I don't know how old you are, uh, but I'm 41 and I feel like when I was sort of coming up in science fiction and fantasy, uh, hope was considered cringy and lame, you know, uh, that there, there was no punk attached to it whatsoever. Like if you were cool, you had to be writing the darkest and grittiest and uh, most F wordiest uh, <laughs> misogynist kind of thing that you possibly could get realism. Uh, and now I think we're all tired. Uh, <laughs> we're all tired and broken. And uh, we all see how, just how hardcore and punk and dangerous hope can be. Yeah. Oh, I read all those things too. And I, yeah, we're the same age. So like I came up reading, like listening to punk rock and, and reading this, these terrible stories and really like raging against the machine. And now yeah. I'm like, we got to break that machine down. <laughs> like, how, how do we deconstruct this machine that we built? Uh, yeah. So it is, um, I think there's a way to kind of balance like hope in the dark at the same time. And hopefully it can still be a fun, dark CD ride as you, <laughs> ride, yeah. you know, the future. Cause it, I don't think it comes, I hopefully it doesn't come off as like a lesson, you know, it's not, I don't want it to come off as like a pedantic book at all, but more like an adventure story that hopefully feels possible. That's the thing. It's actually so much harder to write hope that doesn't come off as condescending or hokey than it yeah. is to write grim dark. It's so much harder. <laughs> <laughs> so you, it's a duology, you said. Uh, so what can you tell us about the rest of the series? When's it coming out? What's the title? There's a second book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, hopefully it, it'll come out next year uh, and we're working on the title and I think it's, I can't say too much about it, except I do think it pairs really well as a, like a story arc together as one. Um, things get worse and bigger and there's more metal involved and scarier um, things happen. <laughs> um, but other than that, I, I don't think I'd be too specific, but, but I think, yeah, there's definitely more, there's more of a machine aspect, more mechs. <laughs> Sorry, my dog, Buttercup is barking here. 
Oh, that's very exciting. That those are all the questions I have. I had a lovely time. The book is great. Uh, everybody should pick up a copy from print. I know they're dropping links in the chat. So just follow those links to get your copies. Uh, and you can find uh, Olivia at. Oh, at OC Core at, um, on Twitter and then OK Chata on Instagram. Okay. And you can find me at Kat Valenti on Twitter as well. Thank you so much for this evening. It was amazing talking to you. It was great talking to you too. Hi, Poppy. <laughs> the cat did How show up, but he, he stayed on the other side of the camera. She's like barking at a wall. She's not the bright thing, but she's very sweet. <laughs> I was raging against the machine. I respect that. Great <laughs> 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 wall. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, once again, lovely having both of you. And thank you to our audience for being a part of it. Um, Thanks, everyone we'll... who came. Thank Bye. you so much. <laughs>